Hello and welcome to Early Childhood Ireland's podcast, which features interviews and discussions on all issues relating to high quality in the early years and school age care sector. In our episodes, we have a range of speakers who are leaders in the areas that matter to Early Childhood Ireland members. And this podcast series is proudly supported by Aricus Insurance, which offers a comprehensive range of cover at discounted premiums for both business and personal insurance products. So pop over and give www.aricus.ie a visit for more information. As you know, in this series, we're exploring the Reggio Emilia philosophy, tying in with exciting news about the National Pajama Day Reggio Emilia project. In previous episodes of this series, and in a series before Christmas, we spoke about the Reggio Emilia term, the 100 languages of children. We discussed the evolution of the approach, the experience of actually visiting Reggio, and how our image of the child impacts how we support their care, learning, and development. In this final episode of the series, we decided to leave setting the questions to you, our listeners, and thanks to those who contacted us with some great questions. So in the first episode of this series, I chatted with Milica Atanaskovic, manager on the Membership Excellence and Learning Team at Early Childhood Ireland, and it was she took us through some of the historical background to the origins of the approach, and I'm delighted to be joined again by Milica to answer your questions to wrap up the series. Melitza's background in early years is rooted in creative arts and child participation. She originally studied design communication before moving into early childhood care and education while living in Australia. Considering training and mentoring as a key element of quality in the early learning and care sector, she has worked as an educator, a service manager and a trainer. She's been to Reggio several times and is currently planning a great, really great Early Childhood Ireland study trip for members. And as I said, we'll come back to talk about that um, in in a little while. So, Melissa, you're really welcome and thanks for coming on the podcast again. Thanks, Maura. Thanks for having me. So uh, one of the questions that uh, that came in was about the term um, special rights. I know in Reggio Emilia, they use the term special rights rather than maybe what we call uh, special education or additional needs. Um, can you tell us a bit more about this kind of approach, for want of a better word, uh, to supporting children? So I suppose some listeners um, may not know more how the enrollment procedures and admissions work within the Reggio Emilia infant, toddler and preschools. Um, and, and I suppose for those that do, I'll, I'll just give a little reminder because I think that's that's an, maybe an important starting point. Um, so access is very important within the centres. So inclusion, um, equality and, and equal opportunity really underpin the criteria for admission. So I suppose what I mean by that is priority access is given to children with special rights and for children with families who may be having issues, you know, providing education and care to their child or children. So the term special rights is used within the Reggio Emilia um, philosophy because it places emphasis on the rights of all children to a quality education and on children's strengths and not their needs. So the decision was made to use the term special rights um, instead instead of special needs, um, you know, for that reason. But I I was just thinking about that question, um, more I was wondering, uh, can I tell you about a project that um, was shared on a recent, I went on a recent study tour in November. Um, and I, Absolutely. I, yeah, I, I just, because when you ask that question, it, it kind of reminds me of this project. Um, now, of course, look, I'm not going to do, do this justice, you know, and you really need to see how this project was documented, but um, I'll just to try to explain how this looks in practice. So, there is an autistic child, um, and, and forgive me, I actually can't recall her name. So I, I, I'll call her, say, Angela, for example. So um, Angela was in a preschool and it was decided that she would start using um, PECs by the therapist that, that she was seeing outside of the preschool. Um, so for any listeners that, that aren't familiar with PECs, PECs is um, a, a picture exchange communication system and it's used um, by a, a lot of autistic children or people to communicate. Um, 
So when this was first introduced, you know, it was very hard for Angela because she didn't know what symbols represented what. Um, so her peers and, and the children within the, within the preschool group, you know, really wanted to um, support her. Um, and in, in dialogue and in conversations with the teachers, they really wanted to actually create what the teachers called an augmented of alternative communication um, and they really the peers really wanted to do that with Angela so um, they obviously had observed her using this sort of method um, to communicate so you know it showed um, you know what the teachers described as and I thought this was beautiful like a solidarity <laughs> you know a solidarity with Angela and you know what she was now you know trying to use within the setting to communicate with not only her peers, but also um, with the teachers and also with her environment and the environment around her. So, so Pex uses pictures. So, you know, to start the research, the teachers researched, the, sorry, the teachers and the children, but particularly the children research symbols. So symbols all around them. So it was really important um, that they use so they use photography, they use drawings to start to document all the symbols they could see in their own kind of environment. So whether that was in the school environment, whether it was in the community. Um, so, for example, you know, road signage, you know, signage that they could see on buildings um, when they're in their cars, <laughs> when they're walking. So a lot of it was sort of walking excursions that the teachers would take them on. But they also took um, a lot of photographs of what Angela liked to play with so they were observing Angela and they were playing with Angela and they were obviously you know using pictures and photographs to help to understand you know what she liked to do um but I suppose you know when the teacher or the pedagogist was sort of explaining this project they were really talking about how symbols were you know being used to sort of become this legacy of the whole group of this sort of shared learning experience and as I was listening to the project being described, you know, it was so interesting to hear how children and adults work together within the approach. And the role of the adult is important, but the role of peers is extremely important for the learning process um, and that role of sort of working together. So, you know, the involvement of the family, so Angela's family in the process, because obviously there was adaptations to the communication system that, Angela was learning to use and because the children her peers and her friends were involved in this process they were then making adaptations to this system so you know the children themselves were really immersed in this process of a, of a shared language and then they were working out how to create symbols so they were engaged in this amazing process of evaluation um, and they did all of this with Angela so you know it really demonstrated um the strength of being together in a learning process and then uniting the strengths and joining everyone's sort of thoughts together. And then the role of the adults in sort of holding that whole process together. So documenting that, ensuring that I suppose the setting was that place of community where, where those sort of differences were broken down. And, and, and I mean, this was a really complex project. Like even as it was being ex in explained, you know, the pedagogy Gista was sort of saying, you know, listen, like this was, they were blown away blown away by how you know the children you know were exploring at such a young age the, these symbols these visual cues how these visual cues represent words the nuances of words and language you know so for example you had a child and, and a group of children who were then trying to work out how to represent together and with and how they have different meanings, you know. So it was the children were recognizing that with is, is being close to someone, but together means closer. So they then together developed two symbols, you know, so discussing how they would slightly differentiate the symbols they were developing. I mean, my mind was like, <laughs> you know, it was like blown. And, and I suppose, you know, back to the question around children with special rights within the Reggio Emilia approach, you know, they, I suppose the schools and the educational settings really believe that you, you must never lose sight of anyone. So no child, no adult. And then the emphasis 
of learning within a group and how children can support each other you know so for a child like Angela who is dealing with a new communication system having the support of her friends you know alongside her you know it honestly it was you know and again I know for a listener in a podcast it's really hard because you know we were gifted with visuals that accompany this project and and actually showed you know the drawings that these children these five-year-olds were creating I mean it was just amazing it sounds incredible and you know the the whole thing of the competence of children comes to mind that when yeah. you you know we've spoken about this before that when you trust children it, they blow you away with their competence and the other thing that strikes me is who better to understand the life of a four or five-year-old than four or five-year-olds <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah that it it makes so much sense to involve them yeah. Um, because they can understand um, much more because they're there. That's their lives. They're living their lives. Absolutely. They're living more. that life. That's fabulous. So I suppose moving on, we've talked about maybe four and five year olds. Another one of the questions we had was, um, and I know you 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 mightn't have um, a full experience of, of this, but a question about, you know, the primary school system um, in uh, Reggio Emilia. How does it follow on from the infant and toddler centers and, and preschools and how are kind of transitions supported at that at that point? My understanding is that, you know, the approach supports children's transition because really, I suppose, at the heart of it is, is giving children a love of learning. Um, and that is, you know, deeply, deeply important within the approach. And I suppose that that love of learning then supports that sort of traditional formal education that children are moving into. But it is important to say there is a primary school within the, the Laris Malaguzzi Centre, um, and my overall understanding is that um, the transition process um, is very much embedded. So the teachers within the preschools would be communicating, you know, with the teachers within the primary school before children transition in so that the children are very supported before they transition, you know, onto, you know, what is formal education. But in all honesty, you know, to answer that question to really satisfy the listeners, I'd have to probably do a little bit more research into it and, and ask, um, you know, I might ask some within the network and kind of get maybe a, a more detailed answer to that. Like that, my answer is sort of based on my understanding, um, but I, I suppose I don't have a, a, a very in-depth understanding of, of what that looks like in, in the primary schools. We might stick you to a blog for that. So okay. uh, <laughs> you've done some research. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that might be something we'll we'll come back to if we get the opportunity. Um, another question that that came in on Instagram was, um, you know, and I think we've touched on some of this before. That idea of being inspired by Reggio rather than doing Reggio. But the question was about. Um, is the reason you get such a good experience of the Reggio Emilia approach when you visit them in Italy is because you get a pure insight as opposed to the um, the Irish system. And I suppose not just Irish system of mixing and matching with other with other approaches. Um, do you think that that idea of mixing and matching dilutes the effectiveness of the methodology or does that kind of speak to you can't do radio in Ireland because they're completely different contexts, completely different ways of living, lifestyles, traditions, cultures, and 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 so on. Have you a little bit more to say about that? Um, it's a really good question, Maura. Um, I think I will try to maybe answer that very honestly. Um, I know you said at the start, and we said in, in the other podcast, you know, I've been really fortunate to go to Reggio on a number of occasions. Um, and I attend the network party meetings on behalf of Early Childhood Ireland. Now, th these aren't the same as attending a study tour, I suppose, just to explain that to listeners. But but nonetheless, it's it, it's always a professional learning opportunity. Um, and I know I said this the last time, you know, it is um, honestly every single time. I go there. 
I learned something and and whether that's personally or professionally even most recently you know when you're there's something maybe personally going on in your life and there's something that happens there and like oh my gosh you know it's like a light bulb moment goes off or something happens that I'm I'm kind of like okay this is you know filled me up and it's prepared me now for you know the next challenge or the next piece of work or personally what I'm involved in but so much for me is about that it is actually so much more than the settings you know it really and truly is about the place and about the city and it's really about this shared vision for the rights of children and that education really is a common good and that in this really small because really Reggio Emilia for anyone who's been there it is it is a small Italian city you know and over the last 60 years they have created this political and, and the cultural conditions to make children visible and to make their families visible and to ensure that teachers thrive. And that is what really fills me with sort of inspiration and a responsibility and direction in my own work. Um, and I think for a lot of people that experience the approach in their own work, but these services, they're not special. Like, you know, they're, they're just examples of everyday experiences for young children and the education and care that the children experience comes from everyday practice so you know the practice as educators that we all can connect with and that our parents in Ireland can connect with and educators in Ireland can connect with because it is what they see every day but what is special is that children are deeply respected and their rights are deeply respected and the educators are deeply respected. So they're constantly studying, you know, I love this studying outside of their discipline. They're constantly questioning, they're constantly reflecting and they're constantly filling each other up and ve- being filled up. So, you know, the the question when it's sort of asking, you know, is the reason you get such a good experience of the approach when you visit in Italy because it gives you a pure insight as opposed to the Irish system? Honestly, yes and no, because you can see this practice in Ireland. You can see this, you know, the, the simplicity, the beautifulness in, in simplicity. What I see is the difference is the system. The system supports the children and the families and the educators. And that for me is the biggest difference. And I'm not saying, I don't mean to, you know, absolutely there, you know, you have ateliers and you have amazing environments and that is all beautiful, but you know more and I know. At the end of the day, and I said it in my last podcast, it is about the relationships that exist. That is first and foremost. So um, I suppose that to me is what always strikes me when I go there you know that and that's evident in a in a commitment in the same commitment that has existed for the last 60 years so you know Italy at the moment is if you think of it politically uh, you know and for listeners that might keep up to date you know most recently you know the state and has moved in in a concerning direction but the municipality within Reggio Emilia is deeply committed to the approach so while their investment overall may have been cut by the state they are still deeply committed to investing the same amount in early childhood education and that for me is a big difference as well um so you know it's I do like to sort of say that I think you would have experienced the same like when you went there it's not they're not saying look at look at our settings and put them on a pedestal and and go go and do that in your own country there no one is saying that you know within Reggio Emilia nobody but what they are saying is that you know education is political and that you know children have rights and families have rights and educators have rights and if they are not seen as valuable you know that where that's where in lies the problem you know I don't know did I answer that now more yeah or did I no just... <laughs> I, I, I think it's really interesting yeah. because I think there's that bit it was even you know um <clears throat> heard somebody uh lately saying about you know going to going to radio and taking loads of photos hmm. and uh you you know from being there that visitors aren't allowed to take photos um because uh it, it you know the encouragement is around 
the the discussions and making notes and uh, reflecting on what you're seeing. It's a it's a long time since I was there, but it's kind it kind of makes sense to me um, even now that it, it it's very much it's not just take the photos of the lovely book area yeah. because that's not doing doing radio and inverted commas. It's it's um, you know going back even to the last episode talking to to Rita Amelia about uh, our image of children and you know, the project uh, about uh, Angela and the PEC system, yeah. you know, the, the trusting children. And if you're focused on just taking the photos, you're not getting that discussion, that richness, that reflection, um, that challenge, I suppose, to, you know, to to see what children um, can do when their rights are respected and uh, enshrined in in practice. And from a funding point of view in the municipality, it's great to have that local support. I suppose it's it's different here in that we don't have council input in um, in funding of education here. And maybe yep. it would be a lot better if we if we did. But I suppose we won't go down that road. <laughs> <laughs> for now <laughs> not yet <laughs> not yet not yet okay so um so moving on then i suppose um the this it was after the the second world war that um Lars Malaguzzi and a group of parents as you explained in the first um episode um started to to look at a system that valued children valued their rights valued the rights of families and to try to ensure that, um, you know, children would grow up in a democracy that was that was valued. Uh, so that was the late 1940s. Um, you know, we're heading for, you know, 80 years since since then. Has the ethos evolved over time? How has research informed any changes um, in that intervening period? How has, um, I suppose, how has the approach changed since the original um, thinking that yeah. caused it to be founded? So another really good question. Um, I think, sometimes I think it's a common misconception that that the approach is a product, Maura, um, and, it, and, it, and it's not, it's a process. So, you know, because it's a process, it is always evolving. Um, I mean, the principles of the of the approach ensure its constant evolution. Um, so if we speak to or if I speak to, say, you know, educational research, you know, research is a priority within the approach. Um, it, it's a research between adults and children, as I said in the last podcast, within the approach, I suppose you're really committed to lifelong learning, um, you know, as I was saying earlier, and studying outside your discipline, but you're looking to all the sciences. So the approach um, is so committed to research, therefore, you know, it's of course going to be really heavily influenced by on ongoing research. Um, so, for example, you know, the neurosciences, you know, it's it's more recently when I was there, you know, there was a lot of dialogue, a lot of conversation around, you know, educational poverty, um, around, you know, what what neuroscience is now telling us. And, you know, there was a project that they that they were discussing around, you know, the first thousand days in the life of the child now even just to think of that as a as a title you know straight away it's it's forcing you to think okay well what should those thousand days look like and and you know so um it's very heavily influenced by ongoing research in the sciences um but also you know professional development um so, you know, I suppose it's through to professional development that you're constantly continuing to build your understanding and awareness. So from my own personal experience, that's what I find. Um, and I suppose that's why I find this approach so inspiring, because if you're inspired by it, you see the wealth of knowledge and, and the values that have developed over the last 60 years. So 
you see how important it is culturally and, and how important the approach is within early childhood education and care. And not just for Reggio Emilia, but for any place or any setting in the world that's inspired by it. So if you're inspired by the approach, you're, you know, as I was saying in answer to the last question, you're really giving a voice to the rights of children and, you know, the rights to parents and teachers and the rights to a high quality education. So when we ask that question, you know, what is high quality early childhood education and care? Well, for me, I, I do think anyone that loves this approach, it, it is what you see in the Reggio Emilia approach because it's a culture of education and how this culture contributes to an improvement in the quality of life of the children and of the community. So it's not just enough to have frameworks and a principle or, or to have an ethos you know the evolution is to maintain and nurture the practices you know the practice of developing ideas of creativity of participation of researching of exploring with children so most recently more you know participation you know which is fundamental within the Reggio Emilia approach well what does what does particip participation mean when you have a, a global pandemic? What does participation mean when your values are being challenged? When you know when public health advice and guidance is saying we can't have parents, you know, or families into our settings. So you have to evolve with what you're being faced with and that you we saw that happening within our within settings within Ireland you know the creativity how we adapted how we looked to you know reflect on what that participation means so you know it's constantly in a state of flux and flow and, and movement and and I suppose that's the beauty of the approach and that's why I always worry when someone says to me oh I went on a study tour and I got it and I'm like do you because I don't <laughs> and I've been there you know so many times and every time I go I'm like oh my god oh my god like but because it's an experience and that's what education should be about mm. we shouldn't have you know we shouldn't have all the answers and we should no one should be said we should be constantly questioning and even when you know a teacher or a pedagogista or a tillerista explains a project they're they're asking more questions than they're giving you answers you know they're actually they're not even sitting there going okay so listen we've got this sewn up they're actually going so it, it came up with this question and, and we were on, trying to answer this question, and, you know, and that's the beauty for me of it is actually not giving you an answer. And that's the challenge, you know, and that's what makes it complex. And for me, that's what I find quite inspiring. Now, for others, it might drive them mad. <laughs> you, you know? I suppose it's, it, it, you know, one of the things that 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 keeps coming into my head as you're discussing, you know, the, and Angela and the, is the time it's having. Yeah that time as educators to sit down to tease out these questions that you you know you really can't do for in five minutes at the end of the day as you're tidying up ready to go home it's it's valuing that non-contact time that time for shared dialogue and discussion and uh really getting to know the children and their families and um and what's going on for them so you know that's that's a question that it's it's kind of leaving me with. <laughs> yes. So so this could be a short answer or a long answer. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think is the most important outcome of the the Reggio approach? Now, I'm not quite sure most, if somebody meant yeah. outcome in terms of for children or families or, um, you know. Okay. Well. What I might do for this, you know, I suppose I'll answer it personally. You know, I know others may have a different perspective. You know, if you asked Rita this question, you know, she she may have a slightly different answer. She may speak more to the image of the child. But I suppose from my perspective, and I've spoken a lot about it in the other answers. Um, but, you know, I think one of the most important aspects of the Reggio Emilia approach is the um, the system. So the systemic approach to education within a really small Italian city. Um, and, and it's really, as I was saying earlier, it's an example of the result of ongoing investment. So you know, 18 percent of the municipality budget is put into the infant, toddler and preschools. So so settings are seen as as an incredible asset to the community. 
and the investment in, in children and, and I suppose, you know, as I was saying in the last question, in, in quality of in the quality of life um, and both both in the here and now and, and for the future, you know, so they're, they're not just investing. They are investing in the here and now and what's happening for children in the here and now, but also it's an investment in their 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 future. So for me, I, I really personally believe that it, it really is a blueprint to be followed. Um, and, you know, that sort of idea of thriving, you know, don't we want to be able to say that children and, and educators and families within our communities, within our settings are, are thriving and, you know, they're not weighed down um, and, you know, you you should really see education as as a joy. And I mean, more, I constantly wonder this, you know, this sector and, and, you know, like yourself, like I've been in it for years, you know, in Australia and in Ireland and, and in both countries, my experience was an overarching feeling of exhaustion, you know, exhaustion from educators, you know, that that they felt, you know, overworked, you know, underpaid, that they were being taken advantage of. And, and so for me, the most important aspect is that the approach is really rooted in the rights of everyone, everyone, you know, and, and I know we talk a lot about the rights of children, but it is the rights of everyone. And, you know, as Loris Malaguzzi, you know, he says, you know, nothing, nothing without joy. And he said this, you know, because he believed that the joy and excitement, like they're essential for learning and, and the learning process. And you must have joy. And it's a natural part of the experience of how you build understanding, you know, and, and how joyful is our sector? You know, how joyful are our settings? And I really, I think about this a lot, you know, you know, and, and goodness, shouldn't they, they shouldn't they be joyful? Doesn't of everyone, course. you know, of course. And, and, and also, but it's not just the educator's responsibility to make these settings joyful. You know, it's about a system and it requires ongoing commitment, ongoing support, ongoing nurturing of everyone, of the children, of the families, of the educators, you know, and it's, it's not enough, um, you know, to I suppose just feel that your responsibility is just limited to one aspect you know politicians policymakers they need to realize that their responsibility is to nurturing the whole system and so for me and, and I know this is a deeply probably personal answer but for me that's the outcome of the Reggio Emilia approach. And that is why I truly believe it inspires so many people. And whether they see that initially, like, and I'll be very honest, initially I didn't see that. You know, I was really inspired by the environments that I was seeing. And I was really inspired by, you know, the, the provocations and how these spaces were set up. But the more that I've understood um, and the more that I've been there, the more I'm inspired by is actually it's, it's that system that they nurture and that that joyfulness that they want to see in everyone in the settings and then that that's then extended out into the community so um that that's important for me and I think that's a really important outcome of the approach but I'd yeah. you know an interesting one to ask other people because I suppose everyone will have a slightly different perspective yeah yeah but that that bit of joy you know it it, it I mean that's what we we learn when we're happy. It, I mean, yeah. Perry, Perry Lavers talks about well-being um, as being a key indicator of quality as well. And Rita mentioned that when she was talking about her um, research in, in, in the last episode, that, that you know, the importance of well-being um, for all of us to yeah. because we, we, you know, if, if we're not well in ourselves, um, in, you know, in the broad text of wellness, um, we're kind of at nothing so um, that, that joy bit so I suppose we're, we're mentioning joy can you update us a little bit on the um, Paja National Pajama Day uh, Radio Media member project that um, we're involved in at the moment? Oh yeah I'd love to I'd love to so um, Maura we've developed a project as you said it's called the Radio Children Project um, and we are so grateful that it is being funded by our National um, Pajama Day. And under the project, we have three planned activities. So the first activity, I suppose, has been given the most amount of attention, uh, attention um, more recently. And, and that's because um, it's supporting a group of members to attend uh, an April study tour. Um, so that's taking place from the 17th to the 24th of April. So. 
I suppose, you know, we were under a little bit more time pressure in regards to that and, and getting and giving um, participants an opportunity um, to apply for that. So we now have participants that have been chosen. Um, so we had an application process a number of weeks ago and we had two some external judges um, that sort of based on a, a criteria chose the participants to attend. So the study tour really offers those participants an opportunity for a really deep investigation on the concepts and the values which are really part of the educational project within the Reggio um, Emilia Infant Toddler and Preschools. Um, but I think it's really important to say we also have two really um, two other important activities um, that we're really heavily involved in planning at the moment. And um, we have shared some of the information on online with our members. But activity two, just to give a little bit more detail, that's happening more in May. And it's going to be from the 17th to the 20th. And we have Reggio children coming to Ireland. And we are going to have two events. I suppose ju sorry. just for clarity, no, it's yeah. not children from Reggio. It's oh, sorry. representatives <laughs> from, uh, from the Reggio children organisation. <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, sorry, absolutely. Thank you for clarifying. Um, at this point, we don't have children coming from Reggio. Um, we just have Reggio, not just, but we have Reggio children um, because there are partners in this project coming and they will be visiting. We are going to have two face-to-face um, -face events um, in the west of um, Ireland and in the East and we'll be kind of sharing more details around those um, in the coming weeks and also we'll, Reggio Children will be, I know now I'm saying it, it sounds <laughs> <laughs> That's a group of children, um, but <laughs> Reggio children will be meeting with stakeholders and policymakers, you know, during their visit. And then we've activity three, which is going to be the development of an e-learning program. And that's um, being done in partnership with uh, Reggio children. So developing um, work for this is really underway and we hope to have um, materials um, ready for by September. So, you know, we really, really hope that um, members will have lots of opportunities to immerse themselves in this approach and immerse themselves in this ongoing dialogue and discussion that, you know, we really want to continue to have. Um, you know, obviously, I'm really excited about it, but, you know, I think this is really a wonderful, as I said in the last podcast, but really a wonderful continuous professional learning opportunity. You know, of course, it's a wonderful opportunity to get to go to Reggio, um, but you, there will still be so many opportunities within this project and within all these activities for everyone together to be learning and reflecting and thinking and then thinking about what that what this approach means within the Irish context. Um, and I, as I was speaking to earlier, more, you know, how we can be having this dialogue and conversations as an organization with policymakers, with stakeholders around a system that, you know, has really successfully over the last 60 years, you know, evidenced what ongoing investment looks like and what that means for communities and for, uh, and, you know, one of the advantages of Ireland is we are a small country, you know, so there's lots of ways this can, uh, I believe, can be really looked at um, to suit the Irish context. So, um, yeah, there are the activities and just, I suppose, encouraging members just keep stay, stay tuned to our social media um, particularly to our website um, we'll have an edition of early pedagogy that will be coming out in March that gives more articles and more information and, and look through this podcast more I hope we have you know shared some knowledge and shared some of our personal beliefs and understandings with our members that you know I hope has has given them cause for reflection and thought and you know I hope to continue this dialogue you know over the next well forever more <laughs> <laughs> forever, forever so, and ever. Uh, I think it's really good th that the the every member has the opportunity to engage and um, you know uh, reflect and be challenged and uh, learn more about the uh, Reggio Emilia approach through the way the project is structured. So you know even if somebody isn't in a position to get to one of the face to face events, the uh, online CPD will um, enable them to dip their toe in the water. So um, so it's great to hear about the, the work that's progressing on, on that. And uh, Melissa, thanks so much for uh, taking the time to come on the 
the podcast to update us and to answer our listeners' questions. And again, thank you to the listeners for sending in the questions. So, um, Melissa, thanks sorry. again. Maura, can I just say, and sorry, I know, I know you're wrapping up there, sure. um, but can I just say, um, you know, if if anyone after listening to this podcast um, or, you know, as we're involved in this process, if they do have questions, you know, please feel free to contact us, you know, whether absolutely. you want to do it via email, through social media. Um, we'd absolutely love um, to answer questions or to support our members where possible. So I just wanted to say that, um, as you can probably tell, I love talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, just a bit, just a bit. <laughs> so just just wanted to so. you know I hope that even if you're someone who is new to the approach um or you know you just have some questions or clarification questions or you just would like to connect please uh, you know I would hope that members would um feel that they can do that anytime great perfect and uh yeah we're any any of our channels are always open for any questions or, or comments or queries so um and thank you for listening to this episode of Early Childhood Ireland's podcast, which is proudly supported by Aricus Insurance. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and spread the word to your friends and colleagues and uh, stay tuned for our next episode. <laughs>